Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to, uh, at least on the East Coast, this evening's seminar, webinar, Defending Our Imperiled uh, Democracy. Um, my name is Paul Joseph. I am a just retired professor of sociology at Tufts University. And Joe Gerson has put me to work in all kinds of ways, including moderating this, uh, this webinar. We have uh, three sponsors for this evening's um, event. Uh, the Campaign for Peace, Disarmament, and Common Security, where I also serve on the Board of Directors, uh, Massachusetts Peace Action, and uh, Watertown Citizens for Peace, Justice, and the Environment. Uh, before we go any further, I'd like to express uh, our appreciation to Cole Harrison of Mass Peace Action, who is handling the uh, technology for, for tonight's, uh, tonight's seminar. And also to express uh, my appreciation for all of you who are participating uh, this evening and contributing both by listening and toward the end of this webinar also with your discussions and questions as well. Uh, a reminder before we begin that this session is recorded, um, is being recorded, and it will be on the uh, campaign's uh, the campaign's website. Um, we are living in a very strange, taxing, and challenging moment. Um, uh, many people note the increased level of polarization in the United States. Uh, a feature that probably afflicts more uh, the elected officials in the United States than the general population, which may not be as polarized as the media presents. That's something for discussion later. Um, but certainly the polarization among elected officials has made it very difficult to respond coherently to major threats that are facing the country and the, uh, and the planet. We are looking at increased levels of political violence. Um, we're looking at an increased tendency uh, to deny legitimate election results. New York Times reported the other day a poll that found that six GOP candidates for uh, the Senate or governors uh, refused to uh, pledge that they would abide by the election results. We even have very dismayingly a record uh, now of uh, uh, supporters for Donald Trump beginning to, uh, the record is beginning, they, they did it before, meddling with the actual mechanics of the voting, meddling with the voting machines in Arizona and in Georgia. We're living in an environment with greater misinformation, with greater disinformation, with uh, an abundance of conspiracy theories that are, some of which are being supported um, by elected officials, including the former president of the, uh, of the United States. We're looking at political gerrymandering. We're looking at racial gerrymandering. We're looking at voter suppression. We're looking at an increase in the number of fear messages in the United States, which is very uh, intimidating and has a very uh, caustic result on uh, the, on the, on the democratic discourse. Um, many people are noting a decline in social trust. Um, reproductive rights are under threat. Uh, many of the key institutions for any kind of functioning democracy, courts, the media, the police, many agencies of government are viewed with increasing suspicion. And there are also broader trends like rising inequality that make it very difficult for a democracy to flourish. Um, many of these elements are true globally, not just within the United States, another theme that I'm sure we'll be tracing tonight as well. So pessimistically, the social fabric is becoming frayed. Um, I'm, uh, I'm more myself a glass half full than a half empty, and I've been looking at that glass empty, listing some of the threats right now. Um, and maybe in our discussion, we can look at some of the countervailing uh, pressures that exist as well. Uh, so uh, we need a response, not only just chronicling the threats 
to uh, the factors that are imperiling democracy, but also what our responses should be as well. We are fortunate tonight to have three speakers that can help chart our way through both the threats and uh, the best types of responses. Um, our first speaker um, is Richard Falk, who is Professor Emeritus of International Law at Princeton University, uh, Director of the Climate Change Project, um, the former United Nations Human Rights Rapporteur in the Palestinian Occupied Territories, and a member of the uh, Nations Editorial Board. Um, I'm also happy to report that Richard's book, The Endangered Planet, was named recently one of the six most influential books on global issues. Uh, we're also pleased to note that Richard is taking a heroic effort of staying up late at our age to order to speak to us from a very different time zone in Turkey. I'm going to introduce the other two speakers right now and then we'll start. Um, Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, the co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. And she's also the director of the Cairo Center for Religions, Rights, and Social Justice. Uh, Reverend Liz is facing a little bit of a family crisis now, and that her uh, one of her children one of her children has a has a a minor injury, but she's attending to it, and she will be with us shortly. And finally, we have uh, Van Gross, professor of history at Franklin and Marshall University. Uh, Van is uh, the co-founder of Historians Against the War, and he is the author of the first reconstruction, Black Politics in America, from the Revolution to the Civil War. Our format is for each speaker to go for 10 or 15 minutes. Um, we're encouraging the participants uh, in this webinar to post questions in the Q&A function that you will see on the bottom of your screen. Um, I'll give a 10 minute warning uh, for the speakers that will finish up shortly afterwards. And um, then we can move to a, uh, to a broader discussion. Thank you once again for joining us and for participating in these important countervailing elements to our world democracy. Richard, you're first. Uh, good. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction and the uh, presentation of some of the themes uh, that underlie this uh, challenging topic. Uh, let me try to uh, say something about what I regard as the primary manifestations of this crisis of democracy, which I regard as deeper and more severe than anything I've experienced in my uh, long life. Uh, and I would begin by uh, emphasizing uh, the outcome of the last presidential election and the aftermath of it uh, revealed for the first time uh, the fragility of what had always been taken for granted, that is, the, accept the bipartisan acceptance of what I would call procedural democracy. That is, that elections are administered in an impartial, fair way, and that their outcome is respected by the loser, and that uh, a transfer of power occurs without uh, objection or incident. Uh, and this was severely drawn into question, of course, by the uh, losing uh, presidential candidate, uh, Donald Trump, who uh, had during his presidential term uh, shown many signs of disrespect for uh, the democratic process and the granting of permission for uh, behavior that radically departed from the understanding 
that had guided uh, the country through uh, bad times and good about the uh, foundational reality of uh, American liberal democracy. And this idea of procedural democracy, I think, is terribly important because it uh, it creates a, a the fundamental link between the citizenry and the government or the state. And uh, in a complex society of more than 330 million people, uh, the the trust the, in that, uh, the, the trust and the integrity of that link is vital uh, to uh, the health of, uh, and really the viability of uh, democratic uh, governance. And I've, I view that as in continuing jeopardy. There is no sense of regret uh, in fact, uh, one feels a, uh, a a sense of bitterness on the part of those that uh, challenged the election and a determination to uh, create a process of choosing leaders without necessarily uh, respecting the will of the people. Uh, and uh, this uh, seems to me to be uh, something that as uh, was suggested by uh, Paul in his introductory remarks is not just an American phenomenon. Uh, and we should uh, be sensitive to its systemic uh, uh, roots and uh, causal uh, uh, relationships to what is happening in this country. At the same time, what happens in the United States is of vital importance to the rest of the world in a way that the decline of democracy in most other countries is not. Uh, it is uh, in a special uh, relationship to the rest of the world, partly uh, through its own devising by uh, establishing hundreds of military bases all over the world, having navies in uh, five oceans, militarizing space. In other words, trying after the Cold War to provide the foundation of global security. No country has ever done that before. That we are the, uh, uh, literally uh, taken on this role of being uh, a global policeman, which is a very expensive thing to do and is part of the problem of the decline of democracy within the country because the overinvestment in the military uh, approach to security has coincided with the underinvestment in the well being of the American people and has caused the deepening of alienation on the part of those people that feel excluded or marginalized and are uh, vulnerable to these conspiracy theories and to uh, simplistic explanation of uh, targeting those that can be blamed like immigrants or uh, uh, Islam or uh, Russia and China. Uh, in other words, distracting uh, the public from uh, the real threats uh, to the well-being and security of the country. Uh, so that uh, the situation is, in my view, aggravated by 
the decline of an independent media, uh, and which tends to uh, reinforce uh, the uh, governmental consensus of the moment. And in that sense, uh, I view the, de the decline of the democracy as partly a consequence of the rise of the radical right, but also partly the failure of uh, the democratic uh, the Democratic Party uh, to rise uh, to the challenge uh, that is being posed and uh, to engage in uh, many of the uh, mis per uh, misguiding of public understanding, uh, especially in foreign policy. Uh, that leads to this perception that you can't trust what the government says and uh, it will engage in uh, double standards, it will complain about uh, terrible violations of human rights of its adversaries while suppressing uh, any knowledge of human rights violations of its allies and friends, the way it, it uh, professes these days concern that is legitimate on one level uh, for the uh, Uyghurs in Xinjiang province, yet it ignores the uh, NGO human rights uh, determinations that Israel is an apartheid state. So you have double standards that are being uh, uh, expressed and lead to a kind of cynicism about uh, the exercise of authority. In addition to that, there is this uh, culture of, uh, on the one level, gun culture, but more profoundly, a culture of killing of innocent people. Uh, and that's uh, partly, uh, and it, it's, it's um, attributed uh, to the uh, uh, presence of guns in the society, which is certainly a serious problem and even more serious is the failure to do anything about them in the face of the mass shootings and the undermining of elementary, elementary sense of security. But, but even more fundamental, is the acceptance of the discretionary killing by the state, starting with capital punishment, extending to uh, the way Im the uh, immigration laws are enforced at the borders, uh, uh, to foreign uh, invasions, to uh, all sorts of context in the drug war, in uh, uh, many settings, there's become an acceptance that the state is permitted to kill. And when it's per permitted to kill innocent people, and not much is done about that. And that leads to this sense of entitlement to uh, take revenge on the society that is uh, uh, manifested in these uh, terrible uh, mass shootings in schools and elsewhere that don't occur elsewhere in the world. And we have to, uh, American exceptionalism has its negative side that has become uh, more pronounced uh, during this period. 
four uh, minutes. Richard. And so I would uh, say, when we look at what can be done about this uh, series of threats uh, to uh, democratic uh, governance, uh, it starts, I think, with trying as best we can uh, to expose uh, the truth of the situation, that we're faced with the dilemma of uh, two kinds of future, either uh, a descent into civil strife if these issues get worse, or a kind of semi-fascism if the uh, uh, law, the uh, forces that are explicitly uh, seeking autocratic forms of government prevail. And once that becomes transparent, the uh, responsibility then becomes one of organizing uh, effective opposition, and it will have to come outside the established party structure. In other words, uh, there needs to be a movement dedicated to the revitalization of democracy, uh, the, re, uh, uh, the respect for law at home and internationally, a new sense of responsibility uh, toward uh, those that uh, uh, are suffering from inequality and a, a, uh, an attitude of hope that is grounded in struggle for a, uh, a different kind of future. It doesn't look plausible at the moment, but uh, with a commitment based on this kind of uh, political clarity, it could uh, produce uh, unexpected good results in terms of the revitalizing of democracy. Let me stop there. Okay. Thank you very much for those uh, provocative uh, remarks, Richard. Um, very appreciative. And uh, I'm sure there's going to be some healthy response. Um, again, I'm encouraging participants to post questions or reactions in the Q&A, and we'll pick them up after the panelists finish their initial presentations. Um, I don't see Liz. Uh, Van, can you take over next? Sure. So. Um... First, um, as I do in every class, I want to make sure you pronounce my name correctly. It's Goss. Goss. Uh, yeah, Goss. That's okay. Um, Apologies. It's a, an old English name, strange name. So um, as a U.S. historian in recent years, I mean, I've been doing, I've, I got out of the standard format for virtually all U.S. historians, which is to focus on a particular period and to think of U.S. history as broken up into very distinct periods. So I was a post-1945 historian for many decades, and that meant that I was expected to know a fair amount, but the further back you went, the less and less it was important. You know, I would never be asked to teach the survey course prior to, the, prior to 1865. And um, like I think nearly all progressive people or people on the left, I assumed that there had been this, you know, decisive break with Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the New Deal, and then, you know, whatever we want to call the 60s. Um, so I don't think of it that way at all anymore. I think that it has become apparent that the continuities of U.S. history since the, uh, I say the so-called so founding, the continuities that extend well back into the, hist the history of British North America. And um, 
I am one of the people who think that the 1619 Project did an excellent job of simply bringing forward something. There was nothing obscure about the idea that this was a famous state. Lots of black men were citing that before the Civil War. We all know in 1619. So the continuities have really come to the fore since Trump's election, you know, belatedly for me and for many others. Um, so let's start with the most, what I think is probably the most basic fact to remember about the current political situation we're in. The Republican Party has carried a plurality or majority of the popular vote only once in a presidential election since 1988. Once. And that was under special circumstances of the aftermath of 9-11, the usual shitty Democrats, sorry, Massachusetts, but, you know, can't speak clearly, plainly, missed every chance, a war president who was, in fact, a very good campaigner. That's the only time since I was a very young man that they were able to win a majority of the popular vote. They are a fundamentally minoritarian party, and they know this. So that is actually the framing political fact for what we're dealing with now, not Donald Trump. In fact, I think, I mean, Trump is a very important figure, but I agree very much with the brilliant Irish, uh, he's a literary critic, but he writes about politics, Fintan O'Toole, who pointed out that the Trumpy people invented Don and made him. Remember, Donald Trump 20 years ago proclaimed that he wanted to run for president as a social liberal and fiscal conservative, that horrible trope, with Oprah Winfrey as his running mate to heal the divisions in America. So he is a very important figure, but he, he is in the middle of something larger. So, um, and remember, you know, prior to 1992, when their party effectively split, that's what Ross Perot represented, was a split in the Republican Party. Prior to that, they looked like a party that could win elections big time, 72, 80, 84, 88, big majorities, sometimes commanding majorities, right? So something happened to them. Now, second point, um, I, for decades, have heard this thing that conservatives like to say, we're a republic, not a democracy. And I always used to make fun of that. I'm beginning to think that, you know, they had, they had a deep appreciation for the continuities of American history, for the fundamentally anti-democratic features, which is I'm not the only person saying this. We all sort of knew this, right? They appreciated the anti-democratic features of our constitution, our legal order, our electoral system, the whole thing not just a few pieces of the constitution and except these were the way it was supposed to be. And they intended to go back to it and built into that. I want to note this because Richard brought this up built into that anti-majoritarian sham democracy. That is the reality for most of our history was a commitment to, you know, formal procedural democracy. Now I agree with you. It's going to a whole other level when the procedural democracy is ignored. That was Donald Trump's special, you know, special sauce that Mitch McConnell didn't like. Okay, so um, you know, a, a republic, not a democracy, means no majoritarian rule in any sense at all, even with restricted ideas of who might constitute the majority. Um, open disfranchisement, extremely restricted electorates. And my fear is not about Donald Trump running again and winning again, as horrible as that would be, but that we will return to that reality which dominates U.S. history. And there are ample, ample precedents in our history for that reality of a sham procedural democracy um, receiving um, legitimation via Supreme Courts. First and foremost, because of Article 1 in the constitution, which specifies, and of course they've rediscovered this, something that none of us were paying enough attention to, that reserves to states the right to choose how their electors, you know, vote in the, who the electors are, right? And that's never been challenged. And the only way around it is the National Popular Vote Compact, unless you revise the constitution itself and take that out. Okay, so what am I talking about? From 1790 or 1789, if you want to be picky, the ratification to 1860. The U.S. is not a nation. Whatever present day ideas, 20th century ideas you have about nations, nation states, forget it. That's not accurate. The United States is literally what it says. It's a union of states, a republic of republics. This is the newest history going back. Those are sovereign republics. They have conceded very limited power to the federal union, which is the term they use. They describe themselves as the states, capital S, meaning we are each a state. 
and they've conceded a certain amount of power and limited constitutional projections, mainly the Privileges and Immunities Clause, which is about guaranteeing contractual obligations between states. And beyond that, no one was ever quite sure what it meant. So um, in the Union of 1789-1860, a state could do anything at all it wanted to either exclude or admit voters. It could exclude poor men or paupers, and many of them did, meaning someone who didn't pay a really nominal tax. Even Thaddeus Stevens, the hero of Lancaster, probably the most revolutionary figure in American political history. And if you haven't heard of Thaddeus Stevens, go wiki him and, you know, I'm sorry, you should. Okay, a real Jacobin, even he wanted to exclude paupers, like emphatically, like they should not vote, meaning the desperately poor Irishman that the Democratic Party would take from county to county on election day. Okay, so poor men or pauper exclusion was common. Um, immigrants, naturalized or not. Many states allowed unnaturalized immigrants to vote because they didn't regard voting as so just as unique to citizens. Um, women, from 1776 to 1807, New Jersey, not a minor state, enfranchised independent women, women who were widows, had never been married, had been deserted, and lots of them voted, and they were appealed to as an electorate. So states could do whatever they wanted. They could either, either completely exclude free men who happened to have some African heritage or were, were perceived as such, or they could vote them to, to admit them as voters on the same basis as anyone else. It depended whether you were in Maine or Georgia. So this freedom to let the states do whatever they wanted, that's what we're, that is the precedent here. The second part of this fundamentally undemocratic was the so-called federal ratio meaning the three-fifths clause of the Constitution. Now, I understand why anyone hearing that human beings could be defined as three-fifths of a human being thinks of that as an expression of white supremacy or racism, but that is not actually what it was. The slaveholding states at the founding of this country wanted to count all enslaved people as five-fifths because that would count for purposes of representation. The three-fifths is what the non-slaveholding states forced on them because they knew that this would give them enormous power. That's right. That was the single most undemocratic feature of the Constitution because it meant that the, the states with large numbers of enslaved people had massively expanded weight in Congress and the Electoral College. So I'm going to give you an example. And I'm focusing on this. You understand that there is, that's 70 years of precedent. Don't think that a Scalia would not go and find that or a Alito and say, well, there's this here. You know, the states can do what they want. That was precedent, right? I'm going to give you the example of this. Um, this is from my book, by the way. Um, the biggest state by far before the Civil War, bigger than any state today even California, was New York. Um, in 1840, New York contained more than one in six free Americans. New York, the Empire State. Okay? Um, but the Deep South states, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Arkansas, um, equaled it in the Electoral College, all of those states combined, even though those states had only, all of those states, the ones I just read, that's the Deep South, had actually only half as many voters as New York. But they equaled New York in the Electoral College because of the extraordinary weight of their enslaved populations. They were able to add almost 1.3 million slaves at a ratio of three-fifths. And that way, the Cotton Kingdom could outweigh the Empire State. Now, that's that's not some fancy constitutional mechanism. That's a sham democracy. And that was the way the U.S. was run. Then we get a very brief hiatus, very brief, from roughly 1866 to, depending on which state you're in, 1877 or 1884, somewhere in there, of actual multiracial democracy, where at least all men could vote. Keeping in mind that Mississippi had a black majority until 1940. So this was real, you know, all men could vote. So Mississippi sent two black men to the U.S. Senate. That's what democracy was. That is coming to an end in 1877 when the Republican Party, um, in a certain ways, remarkably similar to today's Democratic Party in terms of its class composition, um, made a deal to hold on to the Senate. I'm sorry, the presidency and pulled all the troops out of the South. The real beginning is 1890 when Mississippi has a constitutional convention for the avowed purpose of disfranchising all of its majority of black voters, but without violating the 15th Amendment. Now, here's the point. 1896, the Plessy decision validates all of this sham democracy, sham legal equality, 
but practically we will accept this. And that existed to well into my lifetime. I don't quite remember the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Act, but I suppose I could. I'm old enough. I could if I'd been paying attention. So that's, you know, 75 years in my lifetime of Paul, Richard, me, many of you. So when was the U.S. ever actually something like, not a very good, pretty shaky, functioning democracy since 1968 until now? And for that brief period of reconstruction, that's the only point when you could say that we meet the rest of the world's notion of what a democracy is. Now, today's Republican Party, you know this, is functionally anti-democratic. They control the Supreme Court. I'm actually no longer, I'm looking and I'm thinking, I don't think they're going to go for total fascist seizure of power. They're just going to go back to what it looked like in 18, 1822, 200 years ago. They'll control all the parts they can control and they'll control the federal government. And that'll be enough for them, right? I mean, I could be wrong. I don't see them mobilizing the 81st Airborne to take over New York City. They don't want New York City, right? So we could end up in a very, very fractured, disunited situation like the 1850s. I will end on this note. Think of the 1850s. I noticed Richard suggested there could be promise in this period. The 1850s, the conventional parties collapse. Large parts of the North simply nullify whatever this, both the Free Fugitive Slave Act and the, the Dred Scott decision. I mean, nullify it. Nullification isn't always states' rights. States' rights had a radical edge in the 1850s. So, you know, we could be it. it and I, it makes me think a little bit of um, uh, a plot against America, the end of that, you know? So we're looking at what Kathy Hochul, Gavin Newsom, J.B. Pritzker might do if the Republicans take, you know, the whole federal government 24 really coming apart. I want to make one more point from the point of view of someone who is a serious, like I take it seriously, political historian, which is what most of us were not for a long time. If you really want to look at where elections work in this country and why it doesn't fit to just put on European fascist models, in this country, elections are still basically controlled at the county level. If a county board of election wants to not three counties in, in, in Pennsylvania right now, including my own. These are big counties. We have the population of Wyoming and Lancaster County. They simply didn't count all the mail-in ballots for the primary. They, despite all kinds of rulings that they had to, they said, well, they don't have a handwritten date on them. Three big counties. County boards are, there are 3,000 of them are crucial. That's where Republicans are going to start just cutting out voters massively. And the Supreme Court will probably let them do it. That's how screwed we are. That's my point. Um, okay. Ben, that's very challenging. I hope so. Um, let me uh, not really seeing a lot on, on the on the QA. Um, much of what you said, Ben, was uh, challenging to me, you know, uh, when I think about the history of the United States. Um, and um, it makes me think, boy, I should take your class, you know, so I can think about the continuities and the challenges that are in this um, in this trajectory. Um, I wonder how the message could be injected into popular culture in a way that had resonance. It was connected with Richard's, you know, call for hope, for renewal. And the rest in the United States, without the um, I, I, would, I don't want to use the, uh, uh, the, the the high bar of working your way through a lot of detailed American history, especially history that doesn't jive with the way most of us have been taught civic studies for twenty years and, and have absorbed. What no democracy except for this period right after the Civil War and in some fledgling and incomplete way since 19, since 1968. Um, you mean we have to do something special to focus on the county electorates in order to preserve our democracy? Um, oh, wow, all of a sudden the state electorals have control over, you know, or potentially have control over the outcomes in state by state. This is, um, uh, Counterintuitive to the way in which most Americans think about their 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 uh, their political culture. 
how, how does this get absorbed into, into popular culture? And I see Liz has joined us, so I'll get back to you in a second, Liz. Yes, take the question now. Well, I mean, for, for historians and everyone else, we're, you know, we're generals fighting the last war. We're, we're looking, we're sort of trying to catch up with the present. It's moving really fast. There's a famous analogy to war of position versus war of maneuver. Most politics is war of position, slow moving, incremental, like trench warfare. War of maneuver is when everything breaks down and happens very fast. We have been in a war of maneuver since 2016, when someone lost by what almost 3 million votes and through the perverse, the perverse but deeply constitutional and historically validated parts of our system won the presidency. So I don't, I, okay, I want to be really direct. The problem here for me is that people like us, the people on this call, are so deeply committed to, or, or many of us have been, I don't want to speak for anyone else, to that sort of optimistic, always getting better vision that Obama you know, offered us in his second inaugural speech. You remember that? From Seneca Falls to Selma to Stonewall. And I, 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 it's incumbent on me to say, this is not accurate. We have not always been getting better. It looked like that at the time of Selma and Stonewall. I get that. But we've been moving backwards, if you want, for quite a long time now. And we need to acknowledge that and not, not because otherwise, and I'll be done with this, otherwise we turn this into just being about Donald Trump and this moment of aberration. This uh -huh. isn't a moment of aberration. This is the nature of the Republican Party. It's deeply imbued in the Republican Party. So it's painful, but we have to face up to the fact that one of our two major parties has gone on way off the rails. Okay. This, I this hope media get... is based up to that fact. Why can't we? Right. Okay. I hope we can get back uh, get back to some of these themes because they're very, very provocative and, and, and very important. Um, let me just turn back to our third panelist. Um, Liz, thank you for joining us, especially under the demanding circumstances of an injury to your son. I hope he's okay. He, he will be just fine, but sorry to be uh, joining in late. Um, had a little urgent care visit, but um, right. we'll be okay over here. All right. Well, thanks for clearing the space for us. Um, why don't you take over and then uh, we'll get back to the discussion among ourselves. Well, yeah, it's it's just great to to join in the conversation this evening, and and um, thanks again to everybody for for the invite. Um, uh, it's always um, great to be at home with um, peace and justice folks um, throughout the country and world. Um, uh, I'm sorry to be kind of jumping in late. Um, uh, I'm really interested in a conversation about this kind of impoverished democracy, this democracy in peril that um, we're experiencing, we're living in, um, in these yet to be United States. Um, I uh, wanna think a little bit, um, and again, uh, apologies if, if any of this is repeating what, what has been said already, but um, wanna think a little bit about um, the intersections of, of uh, racism, um, the kind of uh, problems of economic exploitation and poverty, the, the ecological devastation that's around us, the militarism and war economy, and, and how it all plays out um, in this um, democracy in peril um, uh, in, these, in these moments and times, and especially the ways that um, uh, religious and especially Christian nationalism are, are, uh, um, are helping to undergird um, forces uh, that are, have no interest in um, Kind of a flourishing, beautiful, uh, visionary, multiracial, feminist um, uh, democracy and economy that works for everybody. Uh, you know what I what I want to think a little bit about is is this kind of rolling coup that's happening um, in states across the country, and uh, this kind of largest attack on on our voting rights and on our democracy since um, the first Reconstruction. Um, and I want us to think about how that has everything to do with um, then uh, politicians that come into office often are not uh, democratically elected, um, uh, but who then are, as they're kind of smuggled into office, put forward and pass policies 
that uh, you know hurt um, poor folk and people of color and women and queer people and immigrants and the earth and um, uh, the the most. Um, and I want to think about what uh, what there is to be done in the face of all of that. Uh, you know, the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, which I have the honor of being co-chair, uh, has put out a, a, a variety of different studies um, in the last couple of years, looking at the power of poor and low income uh, uh, people, um, voters of the the 30, uh, the third to 40 percent of the U.S. electorate that is made up of poor and low income people who have really the, the power to transform this entire political landscape um, if we are to overcome um, the voter suppression and attacks on our democracy, if we are to actually have politicians that put forward plans and programs and demands that that speak to the issues that are impacting people the most, and if we are to, to actually have this democracy work for people. Um, you know, what, what we have found is that, um, uh, you know, when we look uh, at at voter turnout, um, um, when we look at uh, people engaging in the democracy, um, that poor folks are are less likely to vote, um, though are still a very significant part of the electorate, the voting electorate as we speak, um, but often are because you know the the politicians and the chamber of commerce right now are are making it harder um, for folks to actually. Um, put forward um, the solutions to people's problems. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, in the midst of this, what it calls for um, in our estimate is a, a movement of people from below um, and building from the bottom up um, and, and lifting from the bottom um, uh, so that everybody in the society can, can rise. But, but we have to look at some of the manifestations of how um, these attacks on our democracy um, are playing out and 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 the seriousness um, of which uh, it it looks um, you know whether it's it's in Grays Harbor Washington where um, some of the very folks that were you know in the U.S. Capitol on January 6th uh, trying to deny um, popular opinion and the election results um, are then the same people that are are going throughout town with shotguns trying to threaten homeless encampments and homeless people or whether it's um you know some of the the same politicians um who again are kind of smuggled into office because we've been through multiple election cycles now without the full protection of the voting rights act of 1965 in alabama or in mississippi or in in other states in the u.s south who um have you know uh raw sewage in their yards and uh you know people voting in in cities across alabama to raise the minimum wage um only to be told that the state legislator is not going to let them do that um and so so i think it, it's really important as we're thinking about this democracy in peril for us to see these connections um but then also to see what dr king saw um you know, at the end of the Selma to Montgomery march um, uh, that had so much to do with the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. Um, what what Dr. King said um, in the last years of his life when he was connecting, you know, militarism and poverty and racism, um, but, but how the kind of Jim Crow segregation and attack on, on people's ability and right to vote um, had everything to do with keeping poor people um, disunited and unorganized, um, but that the Achilles heel of those um, uh, injustices was for poor and low income people across geography, across issue area, across race to come together. And so what I what I wanted to, to kind of show in the last couple of minutes of, of my conversation this evening was some images from the Poor People's Campaign's Mass Poor People and Low Wage Workers Assembly and Moral March on Washington this past June, of which so many folks that are a part of this gathering and part of this network um, played such an important leadership role in. Um, and and what, I'm, what, what I was hoping to be able to do, and I don't know if I'm able to share my screen, but um, was just to, to bring a little bit of, you know, yes, uh, we're seeing, um, uh, you know, legislators 
disallow the re-enfranchisement of felons. Um, we're seeing legislators uh, disallow the kind of passing of, of uh, living wage ordinances in municipalities. Yes, we're seeing, you know, legislators uh, in states like my home state of Wisconsin, you know, uh, you know, redraw the maps um, and and really make it impossible for the will of people. Um, uh, what, what we're seeing is in in states like West Virginia, um, where Senator Joe Manchin keeps on talking about um, doing things on behalf of of the people of West Virginia. We have 75% of folks that believe in passing and, and uh, voting rights. Um, uh, Eighty percent of people saying that we should extend a child tax credit. You know, seventy-eight percent of people saying, you know, we need a uh, healthcare um, uh, investment and and healthcare um, programs for for the poor and low income. And and yet we have politicians standing in the way of living wages, of healthcare, of of all of these issues. And and I think what we know um, and what history tells us is that um, we're only going to be able to be successful in in defending our democracy and and creating the kind of of society that that everybody um, thrives and and not just barely survives in if we don't actually figure out how to build a powerful movement from below. And so um, so anyways, it's 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 great to be here in the conversation. Looking forward to, to more uh, dialogue, really have deep respect um, for the others that are, are presenting um, and uh, just looking forward to more more engagement. OK, let me get to a couple of the questions in a in a, in a second. Um, uh, I, I, I wanted to get back to Richard on one one point was and, and try to build up a theme about what the constraints against a full-fledged dem democrat democracy deepening maybe even emerging in the united states what the constraints are and what the enablers are what the possibilities are richard you had mentioned um uh the failure for an independent media as one of the um your hesitations and um I think in particular, you cited the double standard of how um, the Middle East is treated um, and Israel's treatment of the Pal Palestinians. And I think of the New York Times now, as I mentioned, the half full, half empty image. I take your point entirely when it comes to the, to the Middle East. And you look at the New York Times and all of it's showing the victims in the war in Ukraine, you, who's not shown as a victim of war in the New York Times. But at the same time, I would give the Times or the Washington Post, as they say, exemplars of independent media, um, at least partial credit for its documentation of all of the threats to democracy that we're living in, uh, is living in right now. I mean, they're singling out lies. They use the word lie for Donald Trump in his in his speech. Uh, there was a a, a deep treatment of um, Tucker Carlson. This week in the uh, in the in the New York Times, um, um, they're documenting up the, uh, the the craziness surrounding the uh, Trump's keeping the intelligence documents in Mar-a-Lago. Um, so it's a complicated story, but I wouldn't be completely dismissive, especially if we take a relative judgment about the status of the media in the world today about independent media in the United States. Although, of course, the example you cite is, is quite an important tick on the other side. Your reaction? Uh, I think your, your point is very well taken. Uh, I uh, overstated uh, the critique of the media because I think it, it isn't uh, focusing um, effectively on the real perils to democracy, uh, which I think uh, the other two speakers have articulated very well. And uh, CNN and uh, the New York Times as exemplars of the best we can hope for from the media uh, still create a impression of normalcy and of uh, the, the US as a 
a benevolent force in in the world and uh, in uh, at home. That, and I think uh, Van very uh, helpfully are, uh, articulated this uh, important reality that you can that it's not enough to condemn Trump. You have to you have to uh, create an understanding of Trumpism. What what the soil that uh, allows a Trump to flourish and to, uh, to he is in some ways an absurd character, especially from the perspective of conservative values. Everything about his life contradicts uh, the that image. Yet he he is the kind of uh, autocratic figure that has to create some sense of resonance with uh, Germany and the Weimar Republic after World War One, where again uh, a crazy guy like Hitler uh, captured. Uh, the the masses and was the, the uh, I guess I'm trying to say that the liberal opposition to what imperils democracy is too timid and too uh, passive to really serve as the as a genuinely independent voice of alarm mm -hmm. and we need that we need alarm not just some right. uh kind of balanced reporting on right. uh, domestic issues right i'm not making an argument that we've become totally reliant on the times and the post and nothing else so there still is room for a broader variety of of, uh, of independent media that we need I mean, amy goodman and uh, you know other examples, you know, are, are are very important. Van, I welcome your sort of historical perspective on the role not of of the media in a vital democracy, not just in the procedural sense of a democracy. I don't know. To be honest, I'm kind of I'm uncertain what to make of it because I I do know what you mean, Paul. I mean, you know, the Times is sort of playing catch up. I mean, I just was glancing while we were, you know, here I was glancing, you know, I just got an email from their executive editor about whatever David Leonhardt said. And it's like, yeah, your fundamental threat, biggest threat to democracy. It's a little bit like what Richard said, the most scary thing in, in really long any of us have seen. So they are actually saying that. Um, but it's 2022, you know, um, I'm glad you finally got around to, and they, and it's really good that they called them lies. They, I guess you could say that, and the Washington post, isn't that owned by, if I got it right, Jeff Bezos, yeah. <laughs> you know, they're, they're, they're kind of helping to shore up the broad front, United front, whatever you want to call it, that goes from responsible center, right people over to responsible left-wing people. And of course, there are some irresponsible ones who seem to think the biggest enemy is neoliberalism, which is really missing the point. But anyway, I don't mean to digress. So they can, they help construct that broad front and we need that. That's how, you know, right. we need every bit of it we can get. I don't think it's realistic to hope for more of it than that. Now, the complete collapse of most, I mean, you know, as far as I know, things like the Daily News, the Philadelphia Inquirer, they're all down to like really small circulations. That's the bigger issue. It used to really matter to get us to have the daily. The Philadelphia Inquirer was a major paper. It's not a major paper anymore. In fact, there are very few major papers anymore. So that's that's of concern. The collapse of just local mm -hmm. most journalism. But mm -hmm. I don't know what I mean, unless you institute state controls over ownership of media companies. I'd be in favor of that, of course. But, you know, unless you got to that point, we're at this thing. I mean, the moment when Twitter cut off Trump, well, it was great in the moment, but we're relying on the one, what's his, I don't even remember his name, the owner of Twitter to make that decision. That's a terrible position to be in, right? I mean, we're, we're, we're beholden to some very rich people to do or do not the right thing. So I'm, I don't have anything co that coherent to say, frankly. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Liz, I've got a couple questions for you, but you are welcome to weigh in on this uh, assessment of the role of the media before we go on. Yeah, I mean, I, I also am not sure I have a whole lot to say, except for um, it does feel very important for the media um, in all of its forms, whether it's independent to the the more, you know, New York Times, Washington Post, mainstream media, um, to actually be not just on a morning edition kind of saying, you know, this is the the greatest attack on our democracy. Um, we haven't seen anything like this in, in lifetimes and generations, um, but, but also kind of going back and, and doing a little of that history. I mean, again, uh, 2022 doesn't come out of nowhere. Um, the fact that we've had, you know, multiple presidential elections now without the full protection of the Voting Rights Act, the fact that there's been more or less bipartisan consensus to not actually uh, to to not actually kind of you know protect our voting rights, um, nor even in the media to to talk about the attack on voting rights. Um, uh, the the fact that that when folks are out there kind of struggling to tell different stories and and to defend the democracy, that that folks still really struggle to be able to have those stories heard, um, and and the fact that that there's no kind of pushing on uh, by, on the part of journalists and the media uh, around a bunch of these issues. I mean, there is a lot of work to be done um, and there's a great role that the media could play um, and, and needs to play um, in both, you know, actually fact checking lies, but also just reporting on on the, the kind of history and reality um, and an analysis of, of where we are, um, not just in a way that um, you know, uh, that folks can then just kind of brush off and be like, okay, what's the next headline or what's the next, you know, drama that's happening. Mm -hmm. But, um, but, but really in a way that, 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 that talks about the, the, the dire situation that we're in, but also that, that people still have, have a, a role to play in, mm -hmm. in determining the, the, outcome of their lives um because uh, again there there are popular movements out there that are organizing and mobilizing and um and and we have to hear about that as well could you give us a, a brief um uh, a, a synopsis from your point of view of how the media has treated the poor people's campaign well i mean i think when it comes to the work that the poor people's campaign and national call for moral revival has been doing and and you know the anchor organizations repairs of the breach that's led by the reverend dr william barber and cairo center that I, that i helped to direct um you know uh, you know so much of our work has been about uh both shifting the narrative and getting uh our society, including our media, to actually talk about the issues that are impacting people's lives, as well as then building up the kind of power and resolve to 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 like make the the demands that people are making a, a reality. And 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 we have for sure been able to to get some significant attention to to those issues. And you know, in the in the four or five years that the Poor People's Campaign has existed, um, uh, you know, we've been able along with a lot of other powerful movement building and organizing, I think to, to get society talking and the news media talking about poverty. I mean, years ago, it was a four letter word and people didn't talk about kind of inequality. And then the pandemic hit and, and you know, Trump was in office and, and all, I mean, there's there's been, you know, a whole kind of uprising uh, around the movement for black lives. I mean, there's there's a lot going on um, that we're kind of in the larger ecosystem of, but but where we have been, um, been able to, you know, talk about the issues that are impacting people and, and, and draw the connections really between attacks on voting rights and on our economic justice and, and, and on militarism and, and the war economy and, and, and just the connection of all of these. Um, and yet, um, even though I think there's been, you know, significant um, progress made and, and reporting of the, the work that we have been doing, um, you know, you know, if you read the New York Times again, you know, on any given day, it, it, you, you have no idea what people are actually going through um, in this right. society, whether it's 
uh, you know, people working two, three, four jobs to, to be able to make a living or whether it's, you know, the, the trials and tribulations of, of trying to, you know, uh, assert uh, your, your voice and your vote um, in different communities across the country with the closing of poll places, with the, you know, voter ID laws, you know, all of, all of the different kind of attacks. And so um, I think we've been able to, you know, arrest the attention of, of the nation on some level. Um, and yet we've also, you know, struggled. I mean, this, this past summer, I mean, on June 18th, we, we held one of the largest gatherings of foreign low income people in U S history. Um, and, and the mainstream media really did not, um, yeah. cover it in any real significant right. way. Um, right. and, and I think, you know, uh, when we look at history, that that's always the case with powerful movements. Is that you know, um, if we are waiting for the New York Times to report, you know, on the Black freedom struggles or or um, uh, or other kind of uh, movements um, to improve people's lives, uh, you know, uh, they're they're always late if they ever even show up. But but there there is a role, and especially in this moment when there is so much at stake and when these forces of of white christian nationalists and and mm. you know some of the maga base um are out there uh telling a different story telling a hopeful story that that i see every day when i travel across the country um i think is so important yeah that's, that's uh, very well said i think van made a very important point about the decline of local media too to cover those kinds of stories too uh, my my local newspaper, the Boston Globe, is has also diminished in its coverage. But just in the last couple of months, its coverage of um, uh, De Santos's uh, delivery of Venezuelan migrants to Martha's Vineyard and 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 their background and their story, and also the plight of the homeless in a particular neighborhood in Boston, um, has been magnified by the by the Boston Globe in a way that makes you that calls attention to social problems. Um, but I think generally, and there's a point that's in the chat about this too, about the relative absence of competent media in, in each state. I wanted to just change a little bit here in the theme. Uh, Liz, you used the word um, rolling coup. And uh, one of the other questions in the uh, chat cited um, uh, sort of uh, um, strong, local movements, uh, right-wing political parties, the Free State Party in New Hampshire, and American Redoubt in the <laughs> American Northwest as examples of um, uh, political positions that are roughly corresponding to those that participate in the insurrection in the White House in, 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 in January 6th. And, um, there's no difficulty in looking around the country and seeing these uh, forces in different forms, political parties, militia, um, kind of crazy clubs where people discuss these things um, on the rise. And I think that might be part of the current, some of the currents that are consistent with the rolling coup. So you mentioned New Hampshire, but at the same time, we have Maggie Hassan as a senator, barely, senator, Democrat, holding on and kind of hopefully, you know, reelected. So while New Hampshire might on the one hand be moving towards some sort of uh, really uh, challenging, difficult, unacceptable right wing, there still is a majority that is, you know, at least part of procedural democracy that's, that's, that's quite strong. And I know in your state, Van, too, you've got uh, a very important Senate race which is teetering between some sort of cultural craziness on the one hand with Dr. Oz um, and uh, very attractive, at least from the outside position on the, on the other. I, I, I remember uh, uh, President Clinton's advisor describing Pennsylvania as uh, Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. And All right, Alabama. sorry, that was one of the, he's a, he's a vicious hack to be blunt. He should not be. Uh, it's deeply offensive as someone who grew up here. Yeah, that, good. I mean, honestly, like Pennsylvania, there's no part of Pennsylvania, even the so-called Pennsylvania that looks like Alabama. To begin with, we had no black belt with huge majorities of enslaved people. Southeast Pennsylvania. I mean, you know, Carville's a jerk. 
He Carpet. says things like that to justify their refusal to pay any attention to all the poor and working people in those parts. Mm. You know, he's now there's neoliberalism for you. Oh, this explains it's like Alabama. He must have never been here. Mm -hmm. Lancaster is not Lancaster is a place a lot of us are very proud of, actually. And we have one of the most powerful, as I'm sure Liz knows well, grassroots, multiracial left populist movements in the whole country. Lancaster stands up. And those folks that I know I'm, you know, a su supporter of are spreading that across our state. But just to be clear, and this is a little personal, Southeast Pennsylvania has eight of the top 50 liberal arts colleges. You find any school like that. Those represent a culture. We also have really large numbers of the most committed pacifists in American history. Now, you can say what you like about the Anabat, the old order folks, but they, they don't do anything to support war, right? So the idea that this is these cliches, and I'm not attacking you personally, that could repeat it about red areas of the country. Now, believe me, if you grew up where I grew up, I know what rednecks are like, and or the other lie, and I'm interested in what Liz thinks of this, calling those people working class. The Trump voters are not working class. The average Trump voter, just because they didn't go to college, why would we ever accept the benighted mainstream media equating college degrees, lack of with working class? It's full of people who are employ other people, exploit other people. They're not working class, but you know, this is these are the really bad stereotypes. And I'm not defending white Trump voters at all, but we should be clear about who they are. And, and also the fact that the Democratic Party, as Lancaster stands up, anyone who, if you don't know about Lancaster stands up, you want to see what good left politics look like, look them up, okay? They've challenged the Democratic Party. They believe in the multiracial working class as an agent of change, which an awful lot of people who consider themselves left in this country do not, okay? So the Democratic Party thumbed its nose at working class people of all races and now is paying a price for it. But part of the part of the problem was it was absolutely unwilling to confront the fundamental deeply rooted racist politics among large sectors of our white population in all parts of the country, all parts, suburbs, cities, whatever. So that's that's what we're dealing with, in my view. I don't know, Liz, do you agree? Well, I really appreciate a, a, a number of the things that you just said. I mean, including, I just think it, it uh, one of the, the the lies that has, I think, really hurt um, our politics over the last, um, you know, since Trump was not elected um, uh, back in, in 2016 um, uh, is, is that this idea that his base are poor white people. Because um, uh, I, I think what it, what, it, what it serves to do is drive a significant divide and wedge um, between actually again what dr king would have said is is the weak point is the hopeful um place where poor people can come together are coming together across geography across race across ethnicity across language across religion and i see it you know i see it when i'm in lancaster pennsylvania or when i'm in lowndes county alabama i see it when i'm in you know new orleans um louisiana or when we're in you know uh uh, you know, all parts of Texas and Florida and, and really all over um, is that uh, it is not true that it's poor white people who are electing um, uh, Trump or anyone um, else. Um, it's not true. Uh, sure, there are, are white racist folks of different income levels, um, but uh, but again, if we look at the median income of of Trump supporters, it's it's way higher. Um, it's way higher than other. Um, uh, I mean, even than you know those who voted for Hillary Clinton in twenty sixteen. Um, and 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 this lie um, that serves to I think um, really divide um, and including this lie of red states. Um, you know, our experience is. Um, <laughs> There's not red states and blue states. There's mostly just disorganized states. Um, but that people are there at the ready, actually organizing around the issues that Im impact them. I mean, and I think we saw this, you know, in the Kansas election, you know, this this season, um, when something was on the ballot that was about protecting people's rights, people from the suburbs, from the exurbs, from rural areas, from small towns, from cities, across party line, across racial lines, across religious lines, 
actually came out in way bigger numbers, way huger percentages than anybody expected because we've put people into these boxes and they don't work, they're not true. Um, and, and it means that there's something a lot more hopeful possible, but, but we're not paying any attention to it. Instead, we, we, we just, uh, just our media and, and many of our politicians just write whole swaths of our population off um, and, and let people just, you know, uh, you know, fallow, um, uh, just like not, not be able to thrive. And, 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 and that is insane in a, in a nation that is the richest country in human history. Uh, Richard? Like to add. Uh, uh, it, it's been a very um, enlightening uh, discussion, which, uh, but I feel the relevance of what the U.S. is doing in the world has not been brought to bear enough in our understanding of the uh, uh, failures of democracy at home. And uh, as long as we are investing the resources and energies and propaganda to try to dominate the globe, to dominate the planet, uh, we will not be able to address the issues that confront us domestically. We can't go around the world being uh, the uh, intervening uh, country that is, has no borders, that is a global state that purports to uh, be able to protect uh, countries that it's allied with wherever they are. No other country has done this in history. And to do it is, has drained the resources and the energies and the uh, rationale for uh, humane governance uh, at its roots. So I, I would say that we, we should bring into the domestic dialogue the contaminating effects of the kind of aggressive foreign policy that we've been pursuing in the, these recent decades. And we made a mistake after the Cold War ended in not trying to uh, create a more cooperative uh, multipolar world. We instead thought we could be the only geopolitical actor in the world. And uh, now we're re wrestling with Russia and China and uh, that necessarily plays back into uh, frustration and alienation here in the United States. So I'm very pessimistic about how to, first of all, think about the, the uh, perils of democracy without connecting uh, what happens here at home with what we're doing to other peoples around the world. I think Liz has been very instructive in making those connections at home in domestic, showing uh, how important that has been in the uh, Poor People's Campaign. But I think we also need to make these connections with the uh, destruction of societies and innocent people around the world. Okay, that's very sobering because uh, the impact of US militarism and foreign policy has generally been devastating on, on the chances for democracy and, uh, and uh, sustainable growth uh, elsewhere. And culturally, the United States really still identifies very strongly with the military strength, or a lot of the United States does. Um, and uh, and the, media, the media plays into that. Of course. The media is reasonably sensitive and responsive on the domestic agenda. 
but when you get to foreign policy, it pretty much is uh, responsive to what the Pentagon wants published. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're moving toward the end. Uh, any, any kind of final thoughts? And then we'll have one final summation afterwards. Uh, uh, Liz, can I look at you first? Any, any, any? What should, what's, what should be our takeaways here? Well, I, I, I do want to kind of amen um, as a, as a preacher, um, what Richard was just saying about um, that, that, that the connection between um, what the powers that be are doing in the U.S. Um, to the poor and dispossessed uh, um, around the world is even um, greater. Um, and 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 deeply connected, and so whether that's with sanctions or other foreign policy, and and of course the fifty three cents of every discretionary dollar spent on the military, the Pentagon getting you know more money than they even asked for um, every every go at it, um, uh, and and you know uh, think about um, the the framing and the words of of Dr. King where you know that war is an enemy of the poor um, throughout the world, um, and we surely see that. You know the effects of it on our democracy, on our impoverished democracy, and then on the the kind of economic instability of our people. You know, any any nation that lets fifty two percent of its kids live in food insecure homes, um, and and when you look at the world, um, uh, you know the 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 kind of malnutrition and the poverty and the and the debt um, because of the U.S.'s role in the world um, is is really uh, is. Is just is very sobering, um, and and so then I think the 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 thing I have to say or the the kind of closing is is that I I don't feel um, uh, that it's all hope is lost. Um, you know, uh, if if we look at the role that the U.S. plays in the world and the role that it plays in um, uh, impacting the poor and low income first and worst in this country as well. Um, uh, it doesn't have to be. I mean, the the resources exist. The the policies are at hand, um, and uh, you know we do have um, uh, you know a, a, a growing movement. Um, not just the Poor People's Campaign, but just objectively, what's happening across the country, across the world, is that people are um, coming together and um, and putting forward a vision of 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 what could be and and I think that hopefully in this midterms um, season you know in the U.S. Um, uh, we'll see um, the impact of of folks coming together and saying you know that 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 we can do better um, but even no matter what happens in these midterms um, you know I always want to invite folks here um, those especially that aren't already engaged. Um, there are uh, poor people's campaign coordinating committees and and leaders that are are doing grassroots important organizing um, in communities all across this country and all across this world. And there's a role for all of us to play in it. Great, thank you, Liz. Uh, Van, um, I, I wish uh, we had a longer time to talk. There's so many themes that have been raised here, and uh, the last one where you and Liz were. Uh, doing a gut check on the kind of reductionism of economic uh, class income and, and Trump vote, you know, opens up the door to a longer discussion about what is behind some of the negative threats to democracy and, and why it is, I still think it's true, that so many people in the United States believe a variety of things that are factually wrong. Um, and a, and a challenge. Um, but anyway, Ben, your last words. Well, I think the, the, the broad left, emphatically multiracial left that has developed in this country since the kind of middle Obama years, since it became clear that Republicans would do anything to stop him. If that sounds a little too generous to him, you know, maybe I'm still in the thrall of a, just that moment. Um, you know, Occupy, Black Lives Matter, Bernie, I'm just hitting the major, there's so much more, but really the enormous grassroots mobilization in 2018, 2020, 
That's what moved things. It wasn't Democrats running ads. They run ads and spend hundreds of millions of dollars on mediocre candidates. So I think that the left has been actually gotten much, much stronger in the U.S. in the past 10, 11 years than the prior period. And I was involved from the 70s on. And I remember we had some strong movements. I was involved in Central America. But overall, so it's very exciting to see that. But, you know, this is rising to the challenge. This is part of why we have this movement towards white nationalist authoritarianism. Is they see the rising threat of a multiracial movement, um, you know, of the changing demographic composition of the country, right? You can track white nationalism. Um, you know, why did Ohio go the way it did? Because it has more and more older white people who have been, you know, feel threatened. I mean, that's the shorthand. But let me end on that note. And yet Ohio elects Sherrod Brown. Isn't that proof what Liz says? Sherrod Brown, you don't get much better than that. You know, within right. our conventional so-called bourgeois democratic system, he is a serious principled progressive as much as anybody in the Senate in many years. And he can get, he can win, which shows that you have to actually, you have to walk the talk. You have to show it and have that and get out there. So actually, I want to say one final thing. I, yeah. I indict, I've been very active in the left for a long time, just a foot soldier, whatever you want to call it. I feel that people, of my sort anyway, turned our backs on electoral politics for a very, very long time. We got involved with our 501c3s and our 501c4s and our issue campaigns, and I don't regret any of the things I was involved in. But we we handed that over. The people on the right, I'm not calling them Republicans because the Republicans 50 years ago were nothing like the Republicans now, frankly. They really weren't. They took power seriously. So that's my challenge. We have to take power power, which is not something vague. It's the ability to make something happen as seriously as the right has. And that means taking electoral politics very seriously and not having little illusions about third parties, which are, that's what those are in our system. So I really, that's my challenge is that I came to very late was to take power and electoral politics really seriously. And I hope that everyone, you know, that all of us do that together because we're in the fight of our lives here. Right. It's so encouraging to feel the pulse but with you, both of you, Liz and Van, expressing that 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 real positive energy and that pulse of, of uh, popular struggle. It's wonderful to hear from both of you. Um, Joseph, um, do you have a, a, a word for Dick, for Richard? Joseph, you there? Yeah, I, I, I'm here. And, you know, I've been um, sort of... Uh, whiplashed, if you will, uh, between, you know, the heavy structural analysis with which I agree uh, and the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the hopes that we have in terms of popular movements. And I guess maybe I would, I would ask, I'd ask Dick, what, what do you see in terms of the levers for challenging, uh, you know, the, 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 the structural assaults, uh, not only assaults, but just the, the structural um, uh, inertia uh, that, that's built into the Constitution, built into the culture. Where do you see the, the most important things we can do beyond speaking truth? Because obviously that's that's number one. Well, that's a daunting question, right, at the uh, end of this uh, long uh, session. Uh, and I, I don't have a uh, easy answer beyond uh, reinforcing uh, what uh, Liz and Van have been saying about uh, an empowering left that is uh, really challenging uh, the structural uh, distortions of American society. And um, uh, I, as I've tried to emphasize, I think it's absolutely crucial to uh, start attacking frontally uh, the degree of overinvestment in the military. Uh, I think it's, it's, it, it, should and it should become a major substantive and symbolic issue that that is the 
uh, a potential gateway to transformative change. See, I think if I, I really feel that if one can get the expenditures uh, cut in half from the 53 percent, 53 uh, cents to the dollar to something like 26 cents to the dollar, one would have a different country. And, and just the process of getting there uh, would have momentous consequences. And we have to think about the, con uh, con the interconnections between what happens here and what we do everywhere else in the world. Okay, very well said. Uh, thank you all. Thank you for our participants and attendees uh, for taking the time out of your evening to listen to this uh, important discussion. Uh, thank you, Dick, for joining us all the way from Turkey. Thank you, Liz. My best to your, our best to your son, and I hope that that news continues. I'm sure that, that it will. Van, thank you for your very provocative, stimulating comments and for your rigorous defense of uh, the impact of left-wing organizing on this, uh, on this current moment. It's much appreciated. Thank you all and uh, good night. Thank you, Paul. Many thanks. <laughs>